South Africa's health minister, Zwelium Kize, announced on Monday evening that 434 more fatalities have been recorded over the past as the death toll passes 30,000. According to the minister, the total number of confirmed COVID-19 cases is over a million and the total number of recoveries is more than 900,000. He added that South Africa has conducted some 6.7 million COVID-19 tests to date. Now, still in South Africa, scientists say there is a reasonable concern that the new variant of COVID-19 sweeping across the country might prove to be more resistant to current vaccines being rolled out in the UK and elsewhere, and warned that it makes the need for a global rollout of vaccines even more critical. Professor Shabir Madi, who has led trials of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine in South Africa, said a definitive answer would probably come in a matter of weeks, with extensive testing already underway in South Africa regarding the latest update. The concern arises from the fact that the virus uh, has mutated for more than the variant in the UK. And one of those mutations might mean it can evade attack by antibodies that would normally fight coronavirus. Vaccines teach the body to mount an immune response, which includes creating antibodies to fight the coronavirus, should it ever encounter it. Professor Madi said it was unlikely that the mutation in South Africa would make the current vaccines useless, but might weaken the impact. Now, joining me on the news to discuss uh, the rising cases of COVID-19 around the world as a public health physician, Dr. Alera Roberts. Uh, good to have you join me uh, this morning, uh, Dr. Roberts. Now, you know, concerns are mounting that a strain of the coronavirus uh, may not be prevented with the current vaccines uh, being rolled out. Is this based on facts or just fear? Thank you very much for having me and it's very good to be here. Um, no, it is not based on fact. It is pure, based more on fear in the sense that we, we can look back in history and see the, the, what has happened to other viruses. Viral mutations are not uncommon. In fact, they are rather more common than we think. And, but the virus mutates you know, just a little bit at a time. And it's very rare to have such a jump in mutation yeah. that it would be outside of the efficacy of any developed uh, vaccine. The vaccines, the way they are, I mean, this is not a, a lesson in immunology or virology. I'm not even claiming to be an expert in that. But what I, what I would like is for people to have their fears allayed by the fact that the amount of work that has gone into vaccine development will now be null and void. No, 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 not so. We can look at HIV as an example. All the mutations the HIV virus has gone through, it is still being effectively controlled by the antiretroviral agents that we have. And as fast as it mutates, it's as fast as technology and science has allowed us to develop new uh, um, preventive measures no, or cool. curative measures. Okay. I think that's it. Could the alacrity at which the vaccines uh, were passed for use be a factor in its efficacy? The speed is uh, just uh, mind-boggling. Absolutely. But don't forget that the speed that we see today is predicated on generations and decades of science and technology and development. I mean, I, I always like to draw the parallel to GSM. If somebody had told you on Christmas Day 1999 that in 20 years, every nook and cranny of Nigeria would be connected by telecommunications, something we had not achieved in 50-something years of independence, would you have believed it? But there you go. This is, the, this is the beauty of science and technology and scientists working constantly round the clock. They don't work in the public uh, space. They work quietly in their laboratories. And what we are seeing is the, uh, the, the result of decades of hard work and developing new technology. Mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Roberts, uh, uh, does it bother you that the cold chain required uh, for the vaccine may be hard to maintain in Africa, more so in Nigeria, uh, considering the effect of the potency of the Pfizer vaccine, which is the, the most potent so far? The AstraZeneca one seems more suitable for our weather. 
what hope does Africa have here of getting one that is potent and uh, Nigerian climate friendly? Uh, to be honest with you, when we first heard of the cold chain logistics and requirements for the first two uh, vaccines that were developed, in fact, we all gave up hope of Africa ever being able to meet minus what, 80 degrees centigrade? I mean, come on, we barely managed to keep our refrigerators cold. But the new, the, the latest one, the Oxford AstraZeneca, which just requires regular two to eight degrees centigrade is what we have been doing for decades. I mean, we have eliminated the polio virus, which means that we are capable and we have proven ourselves to be capable of maintaining vaccines at two to eight degrees centigrade and having the logistics and distribution channels to make sure that every last person is vaccinated. I mean, we can pat ourselves on the back and, and stand on our, our, mm. our, our success with the, the polio to do the same thing for the COVID. However, you have you asked the correct question. What hope does Africa have of being able to uh, access this? The, the truth of the matter is that it will require a lot of political commitment, a lot of funding, and that last mile logistics and distribution uh, network that you know would mean that every last person does get the vaccine. Well, I know you'll be as worried as many knowing full well that uh, you are one of uh, uh, the, those Africans who practice uh, you know, public health, uh, more so in Nigeria. Look at South Africa now. South Africa has paid. Other nations on the continent are hoping to get uh, via donations or through the Vaccine Alliance. Is this an effective way to go about this and considering the low capacity Africa has to combat more cases? It's about uh, probably the only way we have of getting the vaccine around the continent. Don't forget, it, it is in the interest of high income countries to make sure that low income countries, low and middle income countries also get access to the vaccine. Because unless we achieve a global herd immunity, the, the virus doesn't get to the US border and say, oh, I better stop here, I don't have a visa. <laughs> you know, there are some things that borders and political uh, uh, parties and whatnot simply do not stop. Viruses are one of them. Environmental degradation is another. You know, so there are certain things that the high income countries are aware. It is not, they're not being artistic about it. They're not being kind and patronizing about it. It is in their interest to make sure that the vaccine gets around the world, including into low and middle income countries. And don't forget that through the COVID, you've got 92 or 97 high income countries who have signed on to it to ensure and support that 92 low and middle income countries do get access to the to the vaccine so the biggest issues that we'll be facing will be that last mile delivery of making sure that we can get everybody that needs to be vaccinated to be vaccinated dr alero roberts many thanks for unwrapping this for us